Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me is this uh, supersized cast here, Richie Schneiderite, Chris Nolaski, and Craig Epstein. Guys, we're going to talk uh, the basketball win against Indiana this past weekend. And today is the first day that the portal's technically open, even though people have been uh, stating their intentions to enter for, you know, over a month now. Uh, but first, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends on Bet Online. And as your continued source for all your sports wagering info, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. It's always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. You can head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Just make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. All right, guys. Well, Rutgers had its uh, first signature win of the season uh, this past weekend. On Saturday, Rutgers beat number 10 ranked. I don't know what they're ranked now, but they're not number 10 anymore. They beat Indiana, who uh, in the summer, Geo Baker on his podcast said that nobody's scared of Indiana. And some Indiana uh, players were quote tweeting that before the game. We've said that they were soft for a while. Rutgers owns them, and Rutgers continues to show who their daddy is. That's the sixth sixth time in a row Rutgers basketball has beaten Indiana. Eight of the last nine. I think we've beaten Indiana in like every sport in the Big Ten this past year, from soccer to baseball to basketball to wrestling to uh, you know basically everything you can think of. Rutgers has beaten Indiana in. Uh, what did you guys see? T- I know, were you guys all at the game this past weekend? I know Craig and, and Chris were. Richie, were you at the game? No, I wasn't. So I'm going to defer to those two for, for uh, I guess, first comment. All right. Uh, Craig and Chris, tell us a little bit about the atmosphere at that game because I, I know that there were some big recruits there as well. Just tell us what the game was like in person. Chris, yeah, I'll, right? I'll, take a, I'll take a first shot. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the crowd was electric. I mean, I got there an hour beforehand. And there were cars lined up trying to trying to get into the parking lot. Um, like I actually had to like find like a side entrance to kind of kind of sneak through a little bit. But yeah, I was I was telling Craig. I think I think Craig beat the traffic. But um, but when I got there, it was insane. And then of course it was filled to the brim. Um, there was a good amount of Indiana fans. But I don't know if you guys saw my tweet. You know, toward the end of the game, these fans were just running down the stairs trying to leave as fast as they could. Man, it was actually pretty funny. <laughs> like, like this, I yeah, running away in their little candy striped pants. <laughs> yeah, like if this one dude yeah. was like couldn't run any faster, I looked over at Craig and he goes, "Yeah, you saw that too." So <laughs> it was it was oh it was God. pretty wild. So yeah, I mean the fans were great. It was loud. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Rutgers plays a lot better at home. They're probably you know they kind of get you know ten points or something. You know, whenever they play at home, you know, it it seems like every time. So uh, yeah, I mean, like you said, Rutgers just really dominated them, um, especially in that first. I thought you know really almost the whole game, you know. I think Indiana only led for about, you know, two minutes and 41 seconds or so. So, I mean, I mean, Rutgers really controlled the game, you know. They were, they they rebounded well extremely early and they were just, they just dominated them in the class. You know, they had, they were in foul trouble. You know, Cliff didn't play all that much, but I mean, they didn't, it didn't really bother, you know, Rutgers at all, really. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I have, I have some notes written down, but I'll, I'll let Craig get his, his, his first thoughts in too. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it might come off, I guess, as a little egotistical, but to me, at, at this point in the Rutgers kind of like reemergence under Michael, this has kind of become par for the course a little bit. A sold out rack, a crazy environment. Of, like, of course it is against the big time team like Indiana, a top 10 team. It's like, of course it's going to be like that. And then facing Indiana, like you said, I mean, of course, they're, of course they won because they, they've beaten them six straight times now, eight of the last nine. I mean, whether Can you imagine any, five whether, years ago, if if we were to tell you that Rutgers beat a top ten team at the rack that nobody even thought yeah. to storm the court, yeah, that's, that's how yeah. crazy so, is that's, that? yep. that's that's the probably the biggest comp. That's really honestly probably the biggest like compliment you can give to Rutgers at this point is the fact that yeah, they beat a top ten team and didn't even feel the need to storm the court. Like that's how far this program has come in kind of really a short amount of time. I mean, since I saw since 2019, 2020, this team is 10 and three at Jersey Mike's arena against AP top 25 teams. Like it's unbelievable. It's like, I saw people talking about them, calling them like the ranked Reapers and calling (laughs) them like all these kind of different things where it's like, yeah, it's like this team. I mean, this team I think is good enough to hang with anybody on any court, but this team at Jersey Mike's arena is good enough to beat anybody. I mean, it's just crazy. And it's really, like I said, 
just the biggest compliment I can give to this team that things like this just have become kind of normal for them. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you guys yeah, both we were getting nails a ton on the of, of love from the national media, too, from this past weekend. Yeah, Barstool, um, Rothstein, ESPN, et cetera. And we kind of, me and Mike actually mentioned it on the, the other pod, or the pod before this, or the pod before that, whatever it was. Every time this team loses and faces adversity, it's just a crazy bounce back. And here's, here's your crazy bounce back. Obviously, we thought it was going to be Miami. That didn't happen, but you lose to Miami, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, yeah, top 10 team? Yeah, fuck me, whatever, here we go. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it's just incredible how much they own Indiana. You guys all mentioned all the stats, but they're just they, even football. Football is beating Indiana. Mm -hmm. Is this a rivalry? <laughs> no, I mean no, because one sided. I, so, yeah, <laughs> uh, true. I don't true. think either team wants it to be a rivalry. I think Indiana <laughs> is still just they have a lot of fans who can't really cope with reality. I think there's a lot of Indiana basketball fans who are also like ca Cowboys fans and Lakers fans and Yankees fans. <laughs> just like one of those programs that has a lot of fair weather fans and they think that they're like a top program still they think that they're like still a 70s and 80s indiana when they're clearly not mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I I admit, there, was a, there was a healthy contingent of indiana fans there which i was kind of surprised about because i can't mm -hmm. remember a time where indiana ever came into came in like that ever really any oh maybe some other teams like local teams but like opposing like an indiana fan base you know i can't really call a time them ever making that trip but i don't know maybe it's just maybe it's because jersey mike's has become such like a big thing it's become like the go-to spot now for really all of college basketball that maybe now people are like hey i gotta go here because it's just you know this place has become like become the place in college basketball yeah i mean how many times does a top 10 your top 10 team like say you're an indiana guy and you're from new jersey new york how many times do you get to see a top 10 indiana team in person and you're out here Probably never. Not so, often. Yeah. So I think that's more of the, just a lot of fans of, of local guys that are Indiana alum. Like I know personally, I know four Indiana alum, which do, again, that goes to the, the fact that all these New Jersey kids just leave state. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I mean, this is like one of the only times you'll get to see him in person. It's a really good Indiana team. I'm not going to doubt that. Rutgers yep. just played phenomenal defense and rebounded and just locked them up. That's it. Simple as that. And that was, that's Tyco's defense. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even talk about the coming out party for, Simpson, freshman All-American, freshman of the year now at this point. I do oh, want yeah, to talk a little did, bit I about think, the, the defense yeah. before we get to that, though, because okay. I think 48 points is the lowest amount a top an AP top 10 team has scored in, like, 30 years from the stat I was looking at, or, or more. I think it was, like, 83 the last time a, a top 10 team has been held to this few points. I read that, like, too. I wasn't sure if it, it was weird or it was way it was worded. I wasn't sure if it was a top yeah. 10 team or Indiana as a top 10 team, the lowest they've scored. I, I don't know. It was worded really weird. But either way, it's just crazy stat. Yeah, yeah, Craig said that in the press conference when he was uh, asking Pike a question, yeah. I thought Trace Jackson Davis from, like, I thought the whole team, I thought Indiana's whole team looked, like, shook. Like, they were shell-shocked from the environment that they were playing in. Like, they had a few, I think there was one pass by Xavier Johnson where he just, like, he went to pass it, but the ball, like, slipped out of his hand and just, like, went out of bounds, and the, the crowd just went wild because I think Rutgers was on, like, a 7-0 run at that point. Like, they just looked shook. They were missing a ton of free throws. They missed a lot of easy mm -hmm. baskets. They went, like, one for six outside Miller Cop from three, or one for 16 outside Miller Cop from three. Wow. These guys just went into Rutgers and came out different <clears> men. It was like, you ever see those pictures of soldiers going into World War One, and then as they came back from World War One, yeah. and they just looked like they've aged, like, 10 years? That's basically what Indiana's basketball team looked like when they left the arena versus <laughs> when they came in. Uh, but, yeah, let's talk a little bit about – yeah, let's talk about the emergence of Derek Simpson. He's had a couple rough games in his first six games for Rutgers, six, seven games. But this was like the irrational confidence that he has paying off finally because I think he went, he started the game like 0 for 6 or something like that. Yep. And then the second half, he never lost any confidence in his shot. He kept putting them up. And he was really the, the tide that turned for, for Rutgers in the second half. Tell us a little bit about that, Rich. Um, I mean, yeah, you, you, you kind of just said everything. I mean, if you even just looking at the stats, you just had a phenomenal game, double digit points again. Um, the one play where he, he had to get picked up, I, I can't, I can't stress enough how much I love this photo of just Cliff, like literally just picking him up and like, it's just, <laughs> yep. it just, you know, shows you how skinny and small he is. Yeah. But yeah. He, as soon as he, as soon as he puts on more muscle, like he's gonna be able to do that a lot more often, in my opinion. Um, he's not afraid of contact. He doesn't care like what happens to his body when he goes up, which concerns me a little bit with his weight <laughs> yep. lack of weight i should say but uh no he just he's a great player he's developing nicely now 
Um, he's going to have to learn how to run an offense over the next couple of years. So I'm, I will play devil's advocate a bit with myself. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't, I guess, set up guys too much. But he is the scorer that Rutgers needs at guard. He's, he's not Geo Baker per se, but a different version of scoring. Um, very, very good game from him. And he's, he's turning into your six man who I questioned, who we questioned all, all season long. Who's going to be six man? Who's going to be six man? I, th- I think it might be Simpson. He's starting to develop into that piece. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I agree. Like, um, like I think, was, yeah. I mean, I mean, he didn't lack confidence. I mean, he wasn't afraid. Like he didn't care. Indiana was a top, top 10 team. He didn't care. You know, it was his first big 10 game. You know, he's over six in the first shot in the first half, but, but he didn't lose the confidence. He was putting up shots and, and his his emergence came right after Indiana kind of kind of took its uh, you know lead in the second half, and uh, you know he scored I think it was like ten points in a row for Rutgers and he went on a, on, a, on a huge run in that and that completely turned the game. Um, you know, he made he was making tough layups. You know he had, and uh, you know toward the end of the game too with about two minutes left he had he had probably the the uh, dagger three pointer from the from the top of the key and that was that was a big play from him too. So yeah, I mean I mean credit to credit to Derek there. Um, obviously a rookie, but but he's not afraid to to you know help this team out any way he can. I think the thing that made the defensive performance even more impressive is that Cliff got two quick fouls. He was out yeah. for basically the entire first half, and they totally shut down their two big men in, in Trace Jackson Davis, and uh, I think the other guy's name is Rice Rice Thompson, something like that. Um, but they did nothing yeah, yeah. in the on the interior, and I think that's just like. Pike, Pike's masterful game plan for this game. Like, they were doubling anybody who got in the, the middle of the paint. They were, you know, just walling dudes off. I thought I thought Mawat Mag played his best game of the season, even though his stats wouldn't really show that. he You could tell mm-hmm. his he's worked a ton on his offensive game. He, he had a – I think he had three or four shots in, in the paint where he just did, mm-hmm. like, this little turnaround fadeaway. That's, like, his shot. Caleb has his shot – is his fadeaway on the baseline, and, and Mag's is the fadeaway in the key. Uh, tell it, like – what did you guys see out of the defense in this game that was just like what was the what was it that they made this such a dominant defensive performance? Yeah, I mean they did. I think really, just, I just want to say a little bit about just yeah. Simpson real quick. Just going back to that, is I don't think I don't think Rutgers wins this game without Simpson. I mean, like no. you said, he scored 14 second half points. He had the 10 in a row. He basically propelled the 19 to two run. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and the craziest part is this is just what? He, his eighth ever collegiate game. He just It's like he just started college basketball five minutes ago. So the fact that he's already doing this against a top 10 team like Indiana is just like crazy. And the, and I think yep. if he continues to grow and continues to build upon this, he can, I think he'll be, I think he, Richie, you're saying he'd be a six starter, a six man. I think he could be a starter because watching the game, watching last game, I think you saw down the stretch and things like that, he was the guy on the floor and kind of maybe Cam Spencer might be a guy mm-hmm. that starts coming off the bench because you can see uh, Derek Simpson's speed is just too much for some of these guys to handle. And I think if he can like he can continue to be the spark for their offense, it completely changes their whole offense because you already have guys like Cliff, Caleb, and uh, Paul. But if you've got a guy like Derek Simpson who can – he might not – I don't like you said, I don't think he's going to be – the floor general, that's, I think that's just always going to be Paul. I don't think Simpson is ready for that yet. But Simpson off the ball, I think, can be almost, maybe just mm-hmm. as dangerous because with his speed, it just opens up the entire floor. He can go down low. And this is where the basketball IQ will eventually have to kind of come in in the maturity where he'll have to decide whether he wants to go up with it or kick it out for like maybe a Cam Spencer if he's on the floor or just somebody kick it out for maybe a three or something like that. But I, like I said – if Derek Simpson can continue to just grow his game, this offense is just com- a completely different animal. Yeah, but I guess yeah. you want to talk about the defense too. I mean, the defense was just, it was just unbelievable. I mean, that's what, like, like I said, par for the course, but the defense, this is like one of the best defensive showings I think I've ever seen from them. Holding a top 10 team to 48 points is just like, it's unbelievable. Like you said, they just packed, other than, other than Trace Jackson Davis and uh, Miller Cop, nobody did anything. They scored 34 of their 48 points. So it's just like, I mean, yeah, you can look at the stats and they, t- like, you can look at the stats, look at the game, and no matter what you look at, Rutgers defense just bottled the, their, bottled them up the entire game. Yeah, they, they, they do a really yeah, good you, job. You mentioned you know, right. defenses and, and, and rotating and stuff like that. They did a really good job with that. Um, the, you know, Indiana only had 14 points in the paint. I mean, you know, that's a credit to, to to Wolfolk who came in and Dean Reber who came in and you know for Cliff um you know I know a lot of saw a lot I saw a lot of Indiana fans complaining about the rest but 
I mean, did they even watch the first half? Like, I mean, Clef is getting called for fouls, you know, for, for nothing. <laughs> Everybody on Rutgers was getting called for, for like, for you how know, many charges fouls did they call against call Rutgers in the first half? I feel yeah, like every time we drove in the lane, they were calling yeah. a charge on us. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, Craig kind of said it all about the defense that they did a really good job rotating. Um, you know, they switched up defenses a lot. I know, you know, there were there were times where Indiana was coming down the floor and Rutgers was in the was in the zone look, and then all of a sudden it switched to to man and kind of kind of you know you know shook shook Indiana apart or whatever you want to call it, kind of kind of messed them up a little bit. Um, they did a good job, you know, double teaming. Um, I thought Trace Jackson Davis kind of, I think, I think he was, I think he actually traveled for a lot more than, than what they're called. So they, they, they did a really good job, you know, not letting him, you know, go up, go up or pass the ball. So yeah, I mean, the Pike, Pike was defense in, in this one was, was phenomenal. I think the one thing that kind of concerns me coming out of this game is Cam Spencer was like the the straw that stirred the drink the first probably four or five games of the season. I think mm-hmm. it's shown why he was a you know a, a lower level D one player uh, coming into Big Ten play. I, I don't think he has the ability to really create his own shot, or maybe he's playing with an injury or something like that. Because Pike has started to play him less and less. He's he's had a few really rough shooting nights the last time last few times he's been out. He still clearly has that confidence, but I think. It's shown that he's better suited to be like, you know, a guy who gets the ball kicked to him rather than creates his own shot. Um, and I, I guess they'll just have to continue to, to adapt the offense uh, to get him open looks rather than him try to create those open looks. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's really necessarily. I don't him. mean assuming, kind of assuming that I'm looking at Rutgers' best five at least from last game. But if guys like Can't Spam Spencer and Andre Hyatt are guys that just come off the bench, that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because as we've seen. Those two guys at times be, are really good shooters, and they can mm-hmm. provide maybe a spark if the other five, the five guys on the floor aren't, you know, performing up to whatever Peichel and they want. So, guy, like I said, just I think they, it shows you, and it shows you how deep this team has become. I, I just, I don't know, man. I, I think Cam's still in the starting lineup, like I, without a doubt. The best way, how's, what's the best way to get out of a shooting slump? You just got to keep shooting. shooting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like you just got to keep doing it. I think you just let him ride. I know he's what two of fifteen in the past two games. You just you just got to spot him up in the corner. Just let him keep going. Eventually he'll get out of it. Um, you've seen it in well, you haven't seen it with this team because they haven't had a three point shooter like this. Um, <laughs> if you if you watch the NBA, for example, and I'm going to use my team, uh, Joe Harris goes into slump. Seth Curry goes into fl- slump. You, you don't bench him. You just let him keep going. You lower his minutes a little bit here and there. I mean, yeah, because you can't afford to have one of ten and one of five. Yep. But. Yep. I think as long as you just keep letting him shoot, he'll he'll pick it back up. I don't think he's going to score at will like we, like we thought he might a little bit at, at the rim or drive or anything. But he's a smart guy. He's going to make the smart passes. If he knows he's not hitting, maybe not against uh, Miami, but if he knows he's not hitting, he, for the most part, he's going to play smart and make the right passes, make the right moves, play solid defense at the end of the day. Um, he's, he's still getting a couple steals per game, I think. I forget mm-hmm. what the number is. I don't think he got any on Saturday, though. But, uh, yeah, there, it's definitely an upper level of competition now. It's going to be a little bit mm-hmm. harder for him, but I still think you just – you let him rock. And Simpson's energy is just exactly – he's Jacob Young. Yeah, You need Young. that guy off the bench. You need that spark. I don't think Hyatt provides that spark. And who else is on the bench? Reber. I think Mulcahy goes back in the lineup, so I think Hyatt's out anyway. But yep. Um, yeah, I think it all comes down to just how Derek Simpson continues to grow because if he becomes you know, a f- consistent 15- <clears throat> to 20-point guy a night, you're not going to keep that guy on the bench. And you if can. Cam Spencer, I, I think you, you can, do, actually. But, you know, I if think Cam you Spencer, 100% do, actually. You play starter minutes, but you're off the bench. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I, yeah I, I think that's yeah. Yeah, if you want to put it that way, I guess. Yeah. I like I mean, going back to Cam, um, you know, he obviously, I know I know Richie kind of alluded to it, but he has to kind of adjust to the upper level of competition. Um, guy, guys are faster, taller, quicker. Um, you know, I know I know a lot of his three-pointers lately have been, have been short. They've hit in the front of the rim. Um, I, think, I think it just comes with – you know, having that confidence and having the energy and, and, and stamina to kind of get those up. I mean, I, I like his arc on his three-point shots. Um, I mean, I, I think he'll get there. I mean, I mean, you saw how how well he played at the beginning of the season. Um, you know, he was both he he was great on both ends of the floor. So, um, yeah, I think I think Cam Cam he'll, I think he'll be fine. I think he'll still start. Um, I think I think he just went to the bench more because Derek kind of, you know, I I, I think I think it was really because Derek kind of kind of raided the ship. Um, you know, Paul McKay, he came back. Maybe that has something to do with it, too. He was playing some minutes, too, at guard. So, 
Uh, by the way, it was it was good. It was good having <laughs> having Paul back. I don't, I don't think um, I, I don't know if Rutgers necessarily yeah. wins with that ball. I think I think I think Paul's leadership and and floor general skills and everything you know played a played a big part in the in this game. Um, he made his first two shots and uh, you know when he was coming coming uh. You know, onto the court for the first time, and the crowd, you know, had a big ovation for him. So, um, he obviously means a lot to the team and to the fans. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. His presence, I didn't expect it to be missed as much as it was because, I mean, I, Paul's just like a glue guy. Like he, he's a, yeah. he's a better than you expect defender. He's a better than you expect offensive player. I know a lot of us, include myself included, were talking about how we want Paul handling the ball less this season. And our offense really just didn't move without Paul leading the show. So I was wrong there. Um, so, yeah, this is the first game we had all our players back, and it was by far the best we looked as a team all season. I don't think that's really a surprise. Um, but we do have a tough stretch to continue uh, going into this week. So we play at Ohio State on the 8th, which is, what, Thursday? And then Thursday, we play yeah. at home versus Seat Hall on Sunday. And then the following week we play at home versus Wake Forest. So it's we're still right in the middle of this five-game stretch. I think a lot of us would have been – happy with two and three or three and two. I, I do think three and two is still very possible. Um, I, I honestly think if we win at Ohio State, we win against Seton Hall and Wake Forest too because mm -hmm. Seton Hall hasn't looked great. Wake Forest has looked decent, but they're they're not like, you know, a world beater. Yeah. They're seven and two. Um, they haven't really played yeah. much. Uh, they, they, they beat uh, Wisconsin at Wisconsin, yeah. which is a hell of a win, but yeah. uh, they're not a team that really scares me. What was the final um, score of that one, like 43 to 42? No, it was seventy-eight, seventy-five, actually. Yeah. Oh, it's a high scoring. For but then they followed it up <laughs> by losing by twenty to, to Clemson. So. Ah. <laughs> so, so now let me ask you guys this, and I'll, I'm going to mute myself after this one. Um, is this the same Rutgers team that just wins at home and just doesn't win on the road? I mean, until they prove um, otherwise, they are right. They yep. they should have beaten a bad Temple team at Mohegan Sun, and they played like shit. It was probably their worst game of the season. They lost by six, so give them a little credit there. They were up yeah. by, what, 11 at Miami and fell apart in the second half, and it wasn't even a huge crowd there. It was, you know, Miami fans are the ultimate, like, fair weather fans. Um, this is that team until they prove otherwise, and they proved otherwise yeah. at points last year, but they need to consistently prove they can win on the road, and they haven't shown that. I'll give them yeah. a little bit of wiggle room just because the team wasn't completely healthy for those games. If they were completely had everybody healthy, I think they would have won those games, honestly. But you know, I could say whatever you want. They still lost at the end of the day. So I, but I don't know. I guess I guess we'll find out now that they are all they all seem to be you know at least seem to be healthy. So I got I, I'll give them a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, I know the Temple game was really the first game without Paul. Um, and then you know they they played well against Miami. They kind of fell apart a little bit. But obviously those games were were still close. And maybe maybe a healthy a healthy Paul kind of kind of puts them over the top, like Craig said. So. Um. Yeah. Actually. Actually, in my notes, I kind of wrote down at the bottom. You know, Rutgers has to. You know, f find a way to win to win road games in the Big Ten, and uh, you know, start. It starts with Ohio State. I mean, one of the things a couple of years ago when they're trying to get to their tournament was they didn't have any road wins, and they finally got the one at Purdue. You know, late in the year in Minnesota, whatever it was, uh, both. But um, yeah, they're gonna have to get these road wins to kind of up their tournament resume, and um, obviously, you know, it helps in the Big Ten standings as well too. So. Well, I, I should say they win road games end of the year for some reason. They just don't do it all season long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Rutgers obviously um, has only played two non-home games, and I'll say non-home games because the Temple game wasn't really a road game. And just like Shiano said, he, he preaches di discipline and he preaches accountability, um, but you are kind of what your record and uh, team says you are. If you commit a lot of penalties, you're not a dis well-disciplined team. If you can't win on the road, if you haven't shown you can win on the road this season, we're not going to really trust you can until you start doing it. Like they had that huge win at Wisconsin last year during that top 25 victory stretch in the middle of the season. Let's see if they could do that again at Ohio State. If they beat Ohio State at Ohio State, uh, I'll, I'll start believing that they could win road games regularly. But let's, see, yep. let's, let's bump the brakes on it first. These two coaches um, need to talk to each other because they do the complete opposite. One wins on the road, yeah. one wins on at home. It makes no sense. Like, <laughs> yeah, just let's just merge them into one, and we'll win all the time. Um, and I, just saw, uh, so, I like it. I saw Rutgers. Uh, their net is uh, thirty. Oh, it just came out. If you, yeah, wow, that's actually oh, pretty high. Ken Palmer yeah. net. I think they, they're net. at like thirty. I think last like I the looked, Brooklyn. they're at like thirty-seven or so. 
Yeah, so yeah, Rutgers is also out. 30th in Ken Palm. That's why I ask. Uh, they're up to mm. sixth in uh, just the defense. Um, they were at like 12 last week, I believe. And uh, they're still, they're, they're like the only team in the top 30 who doesn't have a top 100 offense. So we'll see if that uh, comes up to bite them at some point. Um, What's the, um, do you guys know what the neutral site thing is for, for net? Um, yeah. because no, that will, because I think it's like 75 to something and this, uh, that's going to be big for that temple game because it wasn't an away game. Like you said, it was a neutral site. So the mm -hmm. neutral sites, like I think 75 to a hundred, I believe now yeah, with that sounds... being said, temples 155. So that's, that's a tough, tough loss. Well, they are 92 in Ken Palm. So let's hope that the net continues to level out a bit. Um, yeah, because usually be those are fairly close. Usually there's not that big of a disparity between net and Ken Palm. Um, yeah, it's it's just they, they lost a couple quad three, one quad four already. Jesus. Yeah, I'm just looking in the big the Big Ten net. They are seventh, right behind uh, Ohio State, who's 28. Big Ten sucks, though, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the Nebraska. one thing. That, <laughs> spe speaking about the offense, you know, ratings before, um, you know, Rutgers, uh, went down in terms of their field goal percentage at the rim, so now they're. They're 305th in the country. Uh, they were at 284 or something like that heading in, or before the Indiana game. Are you going to talk about Mike wearing sweatshorts, or are we just going to ignore that one? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a good bust when he comes back. <laughs> he, could he could definitely still hear us, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, he, he didn't tell his uh, his, uh, his, his little a a anecdote yet, so he had to get into that. Oh, yeah, when we yeah. start talking football. This is this is, this will know. Uh, yeah, this is you how go. you Coffee know. Number. The trans that transfer portal thread is starting to get to him. Hey, what's wrong Talking with some sweatshorts? They're very comfortable. <laughs> just, it's, I it's mean, hey, here. Just... <laughs> um, so yeah, I do have an anecdote, but let's. Uh, we've talked a lot about basketball. Amazing win. Let's let's keep riding this momentum. I'm really excited for this season. I think this is the best team Pike's ever had. Even though it's not really a great time to say that, considering last year he said that. But I'm saying I think from what I've seen <laughs> in the first eight games, it's the best team <laughs> Rutgers has had under Pike. Um, let's transition to football, though. Uh, football, today is the first day the transfer portal is open, even though, like I said, mm -hmm. we've had guys announcing their intentions for months now. Um, Rutgers coaching staff still has not been finalized. <clears throat> Richie, are you hearing anything regarding the offensive coordinator search? Uh, because it seems to be an hourly question that you get on the boards. Are you hearing anything <laughs> new, any timeline, anything, any information at all? Or has this been like airtight as it seems? It's it's pretty airtight for the most part, but you see that that coaching board I put up for the, in the first place, the OC hot board. As soon as uh, Gleason got fired and Nuns took over, see the second one how it's extremely similar. Everyone that asked me for another board, it's the same shit over and over and over <laughs> again. Yes, there's like one to two more names, but um, based on all the rumor mill that I'm hearing now, it still sounds like Shanahan's a serious candidate, and it makes a lot of sense due to his connections to the staff, um, whether it be coaching with Heatherman, whether it be a, a Pitt alum. Um, big East guy, so he understands. And he, and he, to be fair, like I know a certain someone on our board that's, that's relatively well known hates him and despises the guy <laughs> between the tweets, between the board post. Um, but I, I don't think Shanahan's the worst. And, and Mike, I'll let you dive more into this, but uh, you could talk about how he turned a transfer quarterback into a pretty good quarterback. Yeah, so uh, James Madison obviously is. I think they're in their first year or second year as an FBS program, right? Somewhere around there. Uh, I'm on mute first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're obviously like a, a fairly new program in the FBS. They were ranked this year at some point, even though they're not eligible for a bowl game because they're in that transitional period. Um, and Mike Shanahan, uh, and I hate that his name is Mike Shanahan because everyone thinks he's related to the Shanahans and Kyle Shanahan's <laughs> dad's name, Mike Shanahan. Let's just move past that. So Mike Shanahan, he's led the offense at uh, James Madison for the last few years. They took a grad transfer quarterback in uh, Todd Santillo from Colorado State, who like basically didn't really play a whole lot at Colorado State, and he turned him into one of the best quarterbacks in the in college in general. I think he's like a top twenty-five rating on PFF. Like if you look at his stat line, he's got twenty-seven hundred yards, twenty-five touchdowns, and five interceptions this season. Um, so he, he's actually taken a long winding path. He actually started at Temple, barely played there, transferred to Colorado State, I assume, when Adazio transferred or got hired there. Um, and he had, you know, he had one decent season at Colorado State. He had uh, 2,900 yards, 15 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. 
Uh, but this year on, at James Madison, he just had his best season of his career by far. And I mean, he's playing a weaker schedule. He's, you know, probably 24 years old at this point. Uh, but still he's shown that he could take a, a transfer quarterback and turn him into something decent. Now, do I think we could probably do better and should do better? Yeah. Um, I, like, like you said, a lot of people want Conlon. And based on the poll, everybody kind of wants Conlon. <laughs> but at the same time, does Conlon want to go step down and be, you know, an offensive coordinator? Like, I know everybody will point to Joe Moorhead leaving Fordham to go to Penn State. And he, you know, he basically hit the ground running at Penn State and had an awesome offense, parlayed that into a, a head coaching job at Mississippi State, which he didn't last long at. But still, like, you have to be willing to, to you know, go from the head guy to not the head guy. And that's just not everybody's career path. He might not want to do that. Um, so, yeah, while I think he'd be a good hire, the, who knows if he actually wants that. His offensive coordinator just got hired at Old Dominion. Uh, I think his name is uh, Eric Decker. And I'm saying Eric Decker. I don't know if that's his name, but his last name's Decker. He's now the offensive coordinator. Kev, for him is now Kevin Decker. So Kevin Decker is now the offensive coordinator at – Old Dominion, uh, he, he was the OC in name. I don't know if he's actually calling plays or if that was his philosoph his offensive philosophy or if it was just Conlon's. But, I mean, what's probably going to happen, and we all know this, is that Shiano's going to announce a hire midweek, and it's just going to be somebody that wasn't on anybody's hot board. And we're not going to know much about him. He's going to be the quarterback coach at, like, some weird school. Like, it's going to be, like, the quarterback coach at uh, – I'll just throw a name out there – at Arkansas. And Greg will have had him as a grad assistant at some point, and he'll he'll know somebody on the staff really well. And we're based, it's just going to basically be like a who knows what's going to happen. And and that's just the way Shiano rolls with co coaching hires. How many how many guys have has Shiano hired on his staff that we were like a hundred percent sure, or we were like really hot on the trail of him hiring? It just doesn't happen often. Like Shiano has a deep bag. Uh, of coaches that he's met at different clinics, he's worked with in the past. Um, he's got a big network, so I, I don't I don't expect us to you know be able to predict the offensive coordinator. I think it's just going to happen, and it's not going to be somebody that we're expecting. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, I have I, a I mean, theory that uh, Shiano is just going to announce the hire like five minutes after <clears> Aaron <throat> Judge signs. That way, just that that would be an all time news dumping moment if he does that. Yeah, Aaron Judge to the Giants, and then uh, Nunzio as coordinator. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, hey, yeah he, was, um, he got twenty votes, so don't don't discount Nunzio's. Uh... He's got a lot of family. Yeah, he's yeah he's got a <laughs> huge right. family on the board apparently. Um, <laughs> I love Nunz. Yeah. He's, he's a great guy. It's just he's not he's not the OC this year, not yet yeah. at least. Maybe in the future, I'll give him that. But I don't know. It's 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 going to be interesting. I I don't know where they go. I think we're everyone predicting Shanahan, like myself even. I might, I'm just saying that because, like you said, Gianno might just come out of nowhere and be like, this guy, Arkansas, not even Arkansas. I'm going to go Arkansas State. And that that's him. He's the guy. And it's like, how, how the hell did you find him? He's like, taking he from, the, from? Uh, the Butch Jones uh, coaching trick. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> he's there. He's actually struggling down there, supposedly. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't yeah surprise I, don't me. Know. I don't know what's going to happen. So it's going to be interesting and – on the portal, because you can recruit yeah, without talk, no C. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the portal. It's I'm a little weary of what they're doing. Um, we follow like every player that they they follow on Twitter, or we we track it at least. And it doesn't seem like that they're going very hard after the FCS kids that have entered the portal, despite being a lot of kids from the area that have entered the portal and are interested in Rutgers. Rutgers hasn't really shown interest in them. Um, in the few kids I've talked to, they've basically not heard from Rutgers, and including some people that uh, you'd be very surprised. Um, I'm not going to say names, but Rutgers seems like they haven't really got off the launch pad with the portal yet. Like, they've made a few offers, but the kids that they've offered, they basically have no chance at. Like, Braden Fisk out of Western Michigan, he's, you know, he's already on a visit to Notre Dame. He's got, you know, Florida State interested in him, who's probably going to pay him a bag if he goes there. You have a guy from... From Yale, the offensive lineman, I think his name is Nick Garglio. I'm terrible with names, I'm sorry. Googly, Gargoli. Gargoli, something yeah. like that. They, they have a shot at him, to be fair. Yeah, Rutgers offered him. I I don't, I don't know what the connection is there. He's, he's, a, he's a Long Island kid, I believe. Um, and so Rutgers is making inroads there. And they also offered um, a kid out of Tulsa. 
Uh, his last name's Woodlow, um, who's very good. But again, he's got offers from Oklahoma State. He's got tons of offers already. And Rutgers is probably he's not going to land him. So if they haven't offered anybody uh, in terms of skill position players who I would say are priority one, two, and three for the staff, in my opinion. They haven't really shown any interest in a lot of the FCS kids that have entered, despite them being interested in Rutgers. Like a kid like Naeem Simmons, Rutgers has no excuse for not showing interest in him. He played against Rutgers this year, and he had three catches for 55 yards in the first half and like a nine-yard rush. He, had, he drew a DPI in the end zone, which would have been a touchdown had he not gotten mugged, which led to Wagner's only touchdown. Like the kid played well. At one point, he was the number one receiver on PFF this year. I think he finished in the top 25. But Rutgers hasn't shown any interest in him. He's got a bunch of FBS offers at this point. There's a guy, Mekhi Jackson, who was arguably the, the, the best freshman in the FCS this year at St. Francis. He had almost 1,000 yards. He was their entire offense. Uh, I think St. Francis won its first NEC title in like over a decade with him leading the offense. Rutgers has basically shown no interest in him. And I can keep going on and on. I don't get it. I can only assume that they – either have an inkling that they are in a good position with some power five level kids that are going to transfer or Greg is putting all the eggs in that basket that it's going. He's, he wants kids that have shown that can play at the big 10 level, but those kids are also going to have a ton of options. So I'm still skeptical as to direct the direction that we're going to go in the, in the portal. As for recording this, we've had two big New Jersey kids enter the portal uh, first with Devin Leary, who's the quarterback at NC State. He had a shoulder injury this year. They were, NC State was undefeated in the lead-up to the uh, NC or the, the Syracuse game um, where they lost with the back of quarterback. He looked great. He's looked great for the last couple of years. Uh, there were some rumors that he was going to enter the portal a couple of years ago, and he ended up sticking it out at NC State. He would be a huge upgrade to our quarterback room. I think he's only got one year of eligibility left. Would love to land to him. He's from uh, – He's from uh, Timber Creek in South Jersey. Uh, his brother, uh, Donovan Leary, is a backup quarterback right now for Illinois. Illinois obviously just had a great year. With, with, when you're a graduate transfer, though, you're not necessarily looking for, like, who in my family is playing for a school. You want to be able to go in and play right away. Rutgers certainly offers that. I don't know the whole quarterback situation at Illinois other than it's, like, all New Jersey guys. Um <laughs> And another huge uh, transfer portal entrant, Jaden Bellamy from Bergen Catholic, who Rutgers finished, I believe, as a runner-up in his recruitment. Yep. So that could be a guy that Rutgers shows a ton of interest in. I, I'd imagine they would have a really good shot at landing him, assuming that he wants to get more playing time. Rutgers has some space in the secondary that has opened up with some grad with some transfer or not some transfers, some graduates. Um, and today's going to be crazy. There's going to be a ton more entrants. Like if you just look at like the quarterbacks that have already announced their intention to transfer, it's like Brendan Armstrong, one of the top quarterbacks in the NCAA. Uh, you got Hudson like Carr, DJ, who's looked great. DJ, yeah, DJ, you, uh, you yeah, DJ, yeah, nine vowels in his last name from Clemson. Um, <laughs> There's just, a rumor just, Drake May might be entering. Like Drake May might enter. Insane. Like Phil Jerkovic. At, at some too. point, honestly, Mike, at some point, you should just start a, a thread of who's not in the transfer portal. I think it'll save you so much more time. <laughs> I think that would be a little bit easier at this point. Um, <laughs> so with all that, with all that being said, Richie, what do you see Rutgers doing in the portal this year? How many guys roughly do you think will land, and what positions do you think will go after hardest? So now this is where. I'm going to go against the grain, and a lot of people are going to be pissed about this, probably including you guys at this point. I, I'm a little pissed about it. Um, the fact that they're offering all these 2023 kids st wait, this late in the process is telling me that yep. they're kind of realizing that they're not hitting portal guys. They're not going to be able to hit on these portal guys, at least. I think it's not going to be as many as people think. I think immediate fact, you need an offensive lineman, an interior guy, or maybe a tackle, actually. It depends on what's available. They, obviously, if you could get a DiRenzo guy that could kind of do both, that's ideal. Perfect. That's actually the perfect scenario. Um, but that's not a given. You got D DiRenzo because he was a South Jersey kid, had a bunch of offers, but wanted to come home. So if you could find those guys, maybe. Like Jaden Bellamy, they're going to push really hard. Or are they going to be able to land him? I, I don't know. Uh, I know Greg has a pretty good relationship with him. Obviously, Nunn's coached him a little bit at Bergen, I think his freshman year originally. Um, I can't, I can't say for certain on that one, but, um, obviously there's a the connection there. So that's one I would probably keep a close eye on. 
you probably need a DB, whether that be a slot corner. And who, there's a kid named Charles Makwa that's just sitting in the portal, and it's it's kind of pissing me off that he's not committed yet. Um, besides the point, sorry. Um, they need a safety probably next to uh, Igbenosin. I know Izian's gone, which I, I kind of told you guys, I kind of hinted at. Um, he wants to test the NFL waters. I, I don't know if he'll end up making it because of his height, but he, he's a good tackler. He's a good player. So we'll see what happens there. But um, so um, look at that offensive line, um, DB, whether that be slot or safety. Uh, it, in my opinion, you need 15 guys at least. Maybe not yeah. at least, 10 to 15 guys. But I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're they're content with going the high school route and developing these guys kind of like a Pico esque type stuff where it's like, hey, I can hit the portal if I want, but I can just develop these guys and struggle. But the thing is, like, Pico had a few years. Like, he, he was already pretty good when he was doing this. And he, he developed these guys in – he had a little bit of a gap where I'm trying to – can't explain this well whatsoever right now, but he had a little bit of a – It's quicker to get good in basketball than it is in football. Well, yeah, yeah, that that part, and then I'm trying to say he had like a little gap where it's like, okay, it's okay if you struggle these years. Now it's like, all right, Greg, this is year four. Like you well, have Pico, to figure it out. Pico, you could tell, like you could tell the team was getting better. Shiano, I gotta be honest, it looks like the team is getting worse. This is the worst year he's had since he's been here. I mean, the offense was just atrocious, and it's just it's just like you need to start showing signs of things are getting better. Otherwise, you're gonna have an off season like you're having right now. Like it's fine. You can go. Like I'm not so mad if you want to put all your more of your eggs in the class of 2023 basket, but you gotta make sure these guys develop and hit. It's kind of like baseball, where it's like okay, with the Yankees, it's like okay, you don't want to sign Xander Bogarts, you don't want to sign Carlos, Curry, you don't want a big time shortstop. Anthony Volpe better be a superstar then, because you are passing on guys who are already proven and have been there and done that. So it's like these guys better hit, otherwise there's gonna be some serious trouble in the next couple of years. All right, to give you the short answer, Mike, there's 22 positions on the field. They need 20 positions filled with transfer <laughs> portal guys. I like yeah. running back. I, no, I'll, you know, I'll go 18. I like the whole entire <laughs> defensive line. Maybe yeah. not the one guy in the interior because he's kind of stinks, but um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. there's, there's probably three or four positions. Everyone else could be replaced by a portal guy, immediately impact guy that could probably take their spot ASAP. Mm-hmm. But what Deion Sanders is doing, I don't want to compare. Yeah, But that program is in turmoil and purgatory, kind of like where Rutgers is. You have – he's going to rebuild that program within a year. He walked in, and you know what his first thing was? Get mm-hmm. ready. I'm bringing luggage. Get ready for the portal. You, you're probably in the portal. No, you didn't really do that part. But <laughs> yeah, but he's like – I named my – he's named his starting quarterback already, and it's a portal guy. It's obviously his son, but he's yeah, bringing all say, his starters related? with him. Yeah. Yeah. Dion yeah. is like the poster child for what college basketball football has basically like become and what it's like what it is now because, I mean, he just walks mm-hmm. in somewhere and goes, okay – he brings his army with them, and then they become good. Like that's just that's kind of his MMO or, MO right now. We'll see that if would, it works in Colorado, but I have a feeling, yeah, it is probably going to work. He also yep. just stole Bama's safeties coach for his DC, which is or DB's coach for his DC, which is wild. But um, <laughs> I, I hate to compare, make the comparison because no one has the swag and juice that Dion does. But I, it's just I'm saying, like you can recruit an entire team from the portal, and I might be able to get you four or five wins. Like it's not crazy to yeah. say that, in my opinion. Look at look at Mel Tucker. Man, dog shit as a coach. <laughs> and he literally just got – he got one lucky running back, one lucky guy, and all of a sudden he gets 10 wins, gets a, almost wins. Did he win the big time? I don't think he did. No, he didn't. Um, no, yeah. No. He didn't I mean, make the like, – he got a $90 million they had like, contract. Oh, like 10 wins or something like that still. They had like 10 wins. That's impressive for a guy that's awful as a coach. Kenneth yeah. Walker mm-hmm. got him a $90 million contract. It's unbelievable. That's insane. You got to hit the portal hard. I'm tired of like – mediocrity it's just yeah. it's it's hard to cover at this point even all the like yeah. we all talk about it up in the press box like it's just like oh yep there goes that ball oh, mm-hmm. oh yeah no no shit it's all that one and it's like yeah. Yeah, and like, like, at, on, like at this point we've had three years of a totally anemic offense you can blame whoever you want but ultimately shiano is the one recruited who's signing off on every offer that's made he's the one hiring all the coaches he's the one who says I want to run my offense like this, and I'm going to hire a guy who fits that mold. What, what point does Shiano realize what he's trying to do isn't working? And I need to do something different, whether it be philosophy of offense, whether it be, okay, I need to go and get a quarterback in the portal. I need to go and get three receivers in the portal. I need to go get a tight end in the portal. Because it's easy to say, like, oh, yeah, we made an offer to a, a transfer tight end last year, and it didn't work out. 
So one guy you keep offer, and you didn't offer any others. You keep going. And they didn't even want to offer the guy Stilianos. They thought they were going to get him as a walk-on last year, which is hilarious because the guy was getting offers. Like nobody's going to, nobody's going to pay for school when they have the ability to get it for free. Like you were just deluded if you think that's going to happen. Maybe he'll enter so, the portal again. <laughs> I mean, he barely yeah, played I mean, for I Iowa guess, this year. I guess, I, I guess Rutgers is going to have to like in terms of the offensive offers <clears throat> and stuff like that. I mean. Now all the all the big name you know FBS guys are, are are starting to come out today for the most part you know December fifth, um, and then obviously you know Rutgers it's hard to offer somebody especially on offense but you don't have an offensive coordinator so I mean that's obviously you know the first you know the first task that Rutgers needs to needs to accomplish there is hire an offensive coordinator uh, maybe maybe hire a whole new offensive staff I don't know how many I, I don't know what it's going to look like next year I mean they. Low kind of the defense last year, and then that that kind of improved a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, Shanna said that he was going to evaluate everything, including himself. So, I mean, we'll see what happens. Um, if it, if anything changes, you know, you know, from that. And honestly, honestly, so. I was going to say, just the biggest point I can make is the fact that I understand patience, and it's going to take time for this team to yeah. get consistently good. But in a time where it's really, it couldn't, it's easier than ever to kind of turn things around like that. All I'm asking for, or I guess the me and probably the fan base too, is just just six wins. Like it's they're not asking for a consistent eight, nine, ten win team right now. They're not asking for you, the Rutgers to become a, t- a team that's going to make a, a, a consistent appearances in the Big Ten championship game. It's just find a way to sc- scratch across six wins so they can take a stupid trip to either Detroit or the Bronx in December, and it's like then your then your fan base will be fine. They'll get off your back. They'll be happy. That's really all they want right now. And so that's really the biggest point I can make is that I know it's, I, like I said, patience, it's going to take time. But really, in a time where co- turning things around college f- football shouldn't, isn't, couldn't be any really easier, it's just like just find a way to get six wins. And I think, I think next season is going to be a, good, a, a great opportunity for that because I think there's – I'll give them that this – like we all predicted this year, three to four wins was probably the benchmark. And what do you know? They got three to four wins. I mean, the offense was – a lot worse than I think any of us ever thought it would be, and that's something that has to improve going into next year. But starting next year, I think the the schedule is easier. And as long as Rutgers hires the right offensive coordinator, finds the right guys in the portal, and if they want to recruit guys, they find, will find some maybe find some diamonds in the rough too. There's no reason this team cannot be a six win team next year. That's all. That's all I think we're asking for at this point. Well, and also, if you look at Rutgers' schedule to open next year, we play four games <clears throat> at home in the month of September. We play a 1-11 Northwestern team. We play a 3-8 and eight Virginia Tech team. And we play a 3-9 and nine Temple team. And then we play Wagner. And in between Temple and Wagner, we do play um, probably the – who might be the arguably the defending national champion at home in Michigan. So that's probably not going to be a win. But there – like Rutgers has to go four and one in the month of September next year. But, like they have to. I, if they don't beat, if they don't beat Northwestern, and they don't beat Temple, and they don't beat Virginia Tech, who are all terrible at home, and you don't beat Wagner at home, this season, next season is going to be a total disaster. I, I'm not going to allow that defending national champion champion comment. That's just not no. It ain't happening. <laughs> potentially, George is going to run fucking through them. They might even lose against uh, TCU and Max Brown. Um, Max Duggan? They're not going to lose. Duggan, TCU. whatever his name is. He's terrible. I, I mean, Max if, if, if you're the more people. physical team, yeah, you have a shot. So, I mean, I mean, we saw, you know, soft teams like Indiana lose. And I think, I mean, I, I think Ohio State's a little bit soft. So, I mean, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I mean I Listen, you can put me on all takes for this if you want. But uh, uh, spoiler alert, George is going to win in a blowout against Ohio State, and George is going in a yep. blowout against Michigan in the final that game. one. That's I'm it. telling you, Ohio I'm telling, State. I just, I just gave you the results a month ahead of time, so I'm, feel free to clear up your your uh, New Year's Eve plans because that's what's going to happen. I'm telling you, Ohio State's going to give them a run. They match up a lot yeah, better until than people the, think. Until the first whistle comes, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's going to be a lot closer. That game will be a lot closer, but. We're, we're shying away from Rutgers a little bit. I, we need to get back to the fact that this, this portal is just not being hit hard enough. I think you need three wide receivers. You got nobody. Yeah. You got Isaiah absolutely. Washington. Wow, he's been great for all five years he's been here. Chris mm-hmm. Long, unproven, who I think will be a starter next year. Fair enough. Yep. I, I like him as a, as a wide receiver. So what is he, wide receiver one now, though? He goes from wide receiver four to one? Like I, at, 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 The way our current depth chart looks, he would be. 
there's four yep. scholarship guys. Four. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously what whoever comes in, what I think there's like three or four coming in. Well, isn't but one of our scholarship tr- guys Christian Dremel too, who's a walk, former walk on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah Washington, Christian Dremel, Chris Long, and Max Patterson, who was playing D B last year because you can't you can't figure it out for some reason. So they just every year it's like, Hey, Chris Long, you're D mm, wide receiver. You're, yeah. you're mm-hmm. D B. You can kind of catch your wide receiver. Like, yeah, Sean, Sean Ryan, the wide receiver, was probably their best offensive player this season. You know, th- you know throughout the whole year, oh, yeah. obviously. He's transfer. Cook Shank, you tran- Cook transfer. Shank, transfer. Cook Shank, transfer. <laughs> yeah, Joshua Youngblood. I mean, he didn't he didn't really pan out too well. But, you know, he was said it from day one. I'm gonna toot yeah. my horn like Jerry Carino does on Twitter. He was a bum. <laughs> Josh Youngblood is and a he, bum. Can't run a route. Speak- can't catch. Sorry, Speaking of young blood, he entered the portal today as well. Uh, so yeah, slander, RIP, slander is done. Him. Oh my god! Oh no, there's there's time for Wish more slander. Here. Graham Mertz at the transfer portal too. For you, young blood. <laughs> oh my god! Oh oh! oh. <laughs> oh my god! I got scared for a second. Burn the place down. What is going on? He said, "Light one for young blood." Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I saw Graham Mertz at the transfer portal too, Richie. What do you think? Oh, could fuck he be him. A, could he I be, hate him. He's could he be a rock honestly, guy? you know what? Honestly, that would be my luck. Is I'd have to cover Graham, Graham Mertz. <laughs> he, he, he started Rutgers. Watch and him. Get, he started Rutgers and get and get six wins. He's Wisconsin Sikowski. That's what he is. Nothing better. Richie, if Graham Mertz came to Rutgers and got <clears> six wins, and what, like, what would you do? I just you guys can run the site. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. You can have all three. Okay. Um, and then, like, you're, when he, arguably your best receiver is that running back, and that just mind boggles me. Like, he's not a running back in any way, shape, or form. Does he? Does he have vision? Yeah, no shit. Most receivers in space have vision. Thank you. But like, put Rochelle back at receiver. You have a good running back in Brown. You have a complimentary guys in Young, Manangai, and Salam. Are they the greatest? No, but you have a good little core of running backs. Put Rochelle back at receiver. He's, I, I don't think he's a starter. I think he should be like wide receiver four. Um, but you don't have a slot guy now because Youngblood's gone. Maybe Patterson steps up. But like we haven't seen anything from him to really like step up yet. He's entering, what, year three? Because he redshirted it, played a year, and then this will be, yeah, this will be year three. Yeah. And you, you just got to hit the portal. Like It's clear as day the portal is the best option. Your starting quarterback – or not starting – your starting quarterback was Vedral, a transfer. Your starting – Wide receivers, where Krukshank and Ryan transfers. Alimo, transfer. Johnny Langan, transfer. Iron Brown, transfer. Curtis Dunlap, transfer. J.D. Lorenzo, transfer. Um, D-Line, Mayan Ahanatu, transfer. Aaron Lewis, transfer. best player on the team, transfer. E5 um, Major, transfer. Who else? I'm missing someone. Christian, Brass- Major. Christian Brasswell. Trans- Christian, yeah. Christian Brasswell, transfer. Trans- like, it's, <laughs> you hit the fucking portal. God, <laughs> hitting this shit. Well, one of the more annoying nuts, things like, is like our our wide receiver coach, Samir Shaw, he coached at Fordham in 2019 and he helped recruit like three of or two of the three of their top receivers. They had 3,000 yard receivers this year in Faustus. I'm not even going to try and pronounce his last name, but he has no eligibility left. MJ Wright and DeQuince Carter were the two guys he recruited out of the three re- receivers in that, that recruiting class. They both entered the portal, and Rutgers has not shown any interest in either of them. Like, you have a guy who literally recruited them to Fordham, and they have shown that they're 1,000-yard receivers. They're both top 80 guys in PFF rankings, and that's, like, the top 10% of college football, or top, like, 8%. And Rutgers hasn't shown any interest in them. What the hell are we doing? Like, I doubt that we have, like, these three aces up our sleeve. It's like, we're going to get this guy from from Clemson. We're going to get this guy from Pitt. Like, we, I don't think we have that, so I have no idea what they're trying to do in the portal offensively. I don't know if they're just going to wait to get the offensive staff fully fleshed out and let whoever they hire at OC kind of decide who they go after. But who knows who they're going to go after? Who knows when that OC role is going to be filled? So if you wait longer than like a week, half these guys might already have found a destination. So I don't get it. This is like a hyper-condensed time frame for the portal. Like everything's going to happen in the next two to three weeks. And so you need to really just hit the ground running. And I, I don't see them hitting the ground running. It's it's really frustrating to watch. I mean, most of these guys already know where they're going, to be fair. But you, you got to fucking cheat. I can't say it enough. You have to cheat. Like, I, I don't know yeah. what else you want me to say at this point. Um, 
it, there's there's so many names out there too. Like Nathan Carter for UConn just entered the portal. You know what he had? He didn't have anything really this year because he got replaced. But junior year, he had like a near thousand yard season. Go go reach yep. out. He's right here. He's a New York kid. Reach out. Yep. Hey, what's the worst that happens? He says, "No, I'm I'm actually already going here." Okay, sorry, we, we tried. Throw an yep. offer. Just honestly, just DM him. Just be like, "Hey, like, I, or watch his tape first. Don't be dumb." But <laughs> yeah, but, but any uh, any like, opponent that Rutgers has played this year, they should feel pretty good about making an offer pretty quickly. Like they watch tape on every Temple player for a week. <clears throat> like they know what they're they're walking into with him. They shouldn't have any confusion. Like the same thing with Naheem Simmons. There should be no confusion as to what he is because they played him in person. They watched him on film. And if you're not interested in him, that means you probably think that you're going to land much better players, which TBD, who knows if that's actually going to happen. Yeah. But yeah. It's very it's, risky. It's, it's just crazy to me that the, the portal's not being hit as hard as it probably should. Like it's the more and more I look at this like scholarship chart. It's, it's bare at positions. Like it's it's really bare. Like you have three safeties technically. I don't know if you count Amonkwa as one or not. He's kind of moving piece back there. Um, you have four wide receivers. And this is not including obviously twenty twenty three class because you can only expect so much out of freshmen. You mm-hmm. have three quarterbacks, yep. and I don't think any. Like no offense to Johnny because he might be a decent player, but like the other two haven't shown much of anything. Um. This is just it's it's a rough look and a tight end group. Get a fucking tight end via the portal. Yeah. I said, I mean, I said that months ago. I mean, you got to maybe two. I mean, they Get just the tight, tight end. Not there's no there's no tight end. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, I don't know whatever I'm looking for, but there's just no threat. There's no threat of any tight end usage. Feels like maybe they maybe they throw to Matt Alamo one time a game and he just drops it. Like there's just nothing. There's nothing going on with the tight ends, and you see. You see it in college football. If you, you see it in the NFL, you, they might not be the home run hitters that you know, like an Aaron Crookshank that or that you want. But when you need like four, five, six, whatever, when you need kind of those muck, you know, those dirty yards to get a first down, give it to your tight end. And for when you have a, when you have a young quarterback, they can be a security blanket for guys like that. So I just don't understand why it feels like they've ignored tight end for just so long now. I mean, who? Other than Johnny's like the best tight end they've had in the last few years. And it's like, he's not even a tight end. He's not, he he wasn't even a tight end when he came in here. So it's just like, like, come um, on, find somebody. I'm going to drop a little nugget there too. Langan's returning from what I was told. Alimo is, Alimo is not. So I would not be surprised if he entered the portal or if he might just hang it up because he did have a couple surgeries um, prior prior to the season. So I I know he's kind of like, he's a, you're beaten battered after a while. There's only so much you could do. So. Now you're down to three tight ends. Yeah. Well, actually, no, you know, five or six because you took three. Right, and then and then Victor Kanapka, you know, he did, he didn't, you know, he was out for a long time this season. Shannon said he should be back next year, but um, you don't know, you know, what he's going to look like and everything. Mike Higgins was a freshman; he got some run, but obviously he wasn't, you know, impactful or anything. So it's really just it's really just you know, Giant Lang and 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 that's it right now. I think what perfectly encapsulates Rutgers in the portal right now. Where would you guys say that Rutgers' best recruiting base is right now? Like New York. The, the, the area, New York City, right? Yeah. Would we all agree that New York City is probably the most Sorry. responsive and the, the best recruiting base for Rutgers? There's a New York City kid who plays at Rhode Island. His name's Johnny Cornelius. He was uh, like the fifth-ranked tackle in all of college football this year on PFF. Uh, he entered the portal last week. He's picked up offers from every Power Five conference, you know, Missouri, Virginia, West Virginia, Nebraska, uh, Louisville, Syracuse, Memphis, Indiana, Penn State, Oregon, Auburn, South Carolina, Florida, Maryland, Illinois, Boston College. Rutgers has not offered him. Why they haven't offered him, I don't know. I don't think Rutgers is willing (laughs) to go after kids that they're not convinced going into it they could get. Like, they're not willing to fight for, for these portal kids. That, and I don't know why. I think they would have a great shot at landing him if they went after him. But I think that ship's probably already sailed at this point. Rutgers is I, – I just don't get it. Like, I'm so frustrated with their portal approach because they should like they should be able to be in it for this kid. Maybe they don't land him, but they should be a contender for a kid out of New York City who is a super nice kid. He's not looking for, like, a huge NIL deal. He's just – I don't know. I'm I'm just I can't even talk about it anymore. I'm so that frustrated. <laughs> so <laughs> bad news is you might actually have to see him. From what it sounds like, yeah, he's like. going to Penn State. He's going to play opposite of 
the, the kid who was a top five projected pick and decided to go back to school. Wonder like that's 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 nil too, and that's pretty wild. Is if you have nil now and you have a good player like that, like kids are just coming back. Look at Michael Penix Jr. They're, that man's risking another knee injury to go back. Oh, he's going NIL. back to Washington. Yeah, like it's it's yep. risky as hell. I can't believe he's doing that. I'm actually a little yep. shocked by that one, but mm-hmm. it's it's uh, kind of crazy. Like we, the lack of nil is definitely hurting in portal. It's hurting in this. It's hurting hurting in keeping your players sometimes too. Ugh. Rant over. Damn, that's that's even a bigger kick in the nuts. Is that Cornelius is going to end up at Penn State? It seems like every player that I've been like really frustrated with the staff that they haven't gone after him ends up at Penn State. Like I was, I, they didn't even try for Arnold Epichetti a couple years ago at, when it was like, okay, we have Jim Panagos on staff who recruited him to Temple and was his D line coach, and Rutgers did not even go after him. They just let him. They, I mean, you're probably not going to win that recruiting battle, but to not even try is pathetic. And that's kind of where we're at with the portal, it feels like. If if they're not convinced that they're going to land a kid, they just don't even try. And I I hate that attitude. but Because it's kind of like, oh, I didn't even like that girl. I didn't even, like, why didn't you ask her out? I didn't like her. It's like, yeah, you did. You just didn't think that she would want to go out with you, so you didn't even try. It's like, well, maybe it's she had a crush on you the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> you just, if you're not trying at this level, like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta have the yes. mentality. Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta have the mentality that you're gonna go in there and try and get these kids. And if if you want to win, you gotta at least try. I mean, you know, if you want to turn this program around, you know, for the better, then you gotta bring in good, good, good players. Obviously, winning also helps bring in good players. But you know, like Craig was saying, you know, with the transfer portal, it's it's easier to win now if you bring in, you know, some good players, some good starters, you know. So, I mean, yeah, like you guys said, I mean, Rutgers needs to really hit on this portal. I mean, I mean, maybe, like I said before, the offensive guys, you know, in particular, you know, they don't have an offensive coordinator, so maybe it's hard to, you know, really offer a guy. I mean, you could say what you think the offense is going to look like, but, you know, obviously maybe all the coaches are going to be different. So, I mean, who knows? But, yeah, I kind of I, I agree with you guys. Man. I was going to say it. I think it just and it's probably a story for another day, but I know NIL is a big, big kind of stepping stone for Rutgers right now, but NIL wasn't the reason that they scored, you know, like average 10 points a game this year. So at some point, yeah. you know, you just, you just got to go out there and perform with the guys you have and trust that your coaching staff knows what to do with the guys that you have. So, I mean, I mean this, I mean, look at the Giants. I mean, they have like nobody on offense really except Barkley right now. And, <laughs> You know, they the coaches got you know the coach there get the most out of these out of those guys. So it's all about scheme. That's all it is. It's if you could scheme up some stuff, you could put a tackle as a tight end because for some reason we've been doing that nonstop and it's it's been working. Like you got to just get creative. You got to be able to scheme around. Like your quarterback's not the best. I'll admit it. Daniel Jones isn't by nowhere near the best quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. But they make him look decent because they're making him do little things. They're not making mm-hmm. him. Chuck it down the field and double coverage, although he still does that sometimes for some reason. Did it work yesterday? <laughs> One play, yeah, it did. <laughs> but uh no, like they're they're scheming to make it make him look good. Like that's that's all it is at the end of the day. It's it's not like a super complicated thing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's where Sean Gleason's downfall was too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he didn't he knew he didn't have the talent. He knew he didn't have like the uh the guys up front. So he's like, All right, I'm gonna try to get super tricky. Like they're never gonna see. Me move this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, and then you mm-hmm. get called for a uh, illegal movement, and it's like, yeah, well, no shit, because you moved like yeah. six guys. He got, he got, he got too cute uh, way too many times. If, you know, with, with yeah. his play calling, you know, he tried, he tried, he he tried to do too much. Definitely. Um, so we've gone pretty long on this. I think we've all kind of exhausted ourselves. On <laughs> Mike, you want to tell your uh, your, your, your dream portal. story here before we uh, sign off? Uh, yeah, this we'll is, close this. Is, this is how you know that this. This is now you know the transfer portal thread is starting to get to Mike, and he might need to might need to see somebody pretty soon. Yeah, so I was I was going on a deep dive last night trying to see if there was any uh, uh, digital traces of who we might be going after as the OC, and I fell asleep pretty late. And I had a dream that I got pulled over, and the the state trooper who came up to my car was Augie Hoffman, and I was like are you Augie Hoffman? He's like, yeah. I was like, aren't you, how are you a cop? Like, I thought you were the offensive line coach. He's like, yeah, I'm not coaching anymore. I'm done with that. 
and that's when I woke up. And so that's that's where my brain's at right now. So I hope you guys appreciate it, how much I'm just ruining my, my mental state to uh, figure out what the hell's going on with this coaching staff. Um, I really don't know if this like a premonition of some sort. I don't know if this speaks more towards Augie's like look as a cop or more towards you just like having some, some type of serious issue right there. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll dive deeper into this in a future episode. Um, but we don't, we've already gone over an hour. So let's mercifully let these guys uh, get done with the podcast. Is there anything else that we want to bring up uh, on the site prior to signing off here? Um, last day, sign up. It's uh, $22 for the entire year. You're saving, I don't know the exact amount, but you're saving like 70 something dollars. Um, it's $1.83 a month if, in that case. Shout out to the guy. I, uh, I think his name was Matt. Met him uh, yesterday at the Giants game and he just, he's like, yeah, I remember your site. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. And then he's like, I'm a Commanders fan. And then I just stopped talking to him for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, sign up, sign up now. Like it's, it's so cheap. Like there's no reason not to. Um, I don't know what else. Go hoops. Um, Ohio State on Thursdays, Sundays. Sunday is the big one. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. uh, do we, do we gotta, I think we got to do something for that. I don't know how, but we'll figure something out beforehand. Like a maybe another maybe another group pod, but we'll get a fifth guy in here right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, round robin. Like I don't know. All right, I'm guys. Out. Yeah, uh, I'm out of steam at this point. So thanks again for tuning in. This has been another edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off.